it's not going to be as long as Genesis. It, uh, yeah, I'm setting it at five weeks. For those of you who weren't here for our Genesis thing, that means you weren't here the entire year of 2018. <laughs> um, this is five weeks. Um, do you ever feel like the stories that you have heard in Sunday school when you were a kid and then you become an adult, you feel like you've been duped or tricked, um, that the story didn't go exactly how you read it as an adult in the Bible. Anyone else? Just me? Okay. Just me. <laughs> so Jonah is one of those books for me. Jonah, what do you think of when, you, when I first say Jonah? Yes, the fish. But do you know that in the entire book of Jonah, the, the fish is mentioned in three verses. But yet we focus on this, this fish. And, and as a kid, I hear the story about Jonah who didn't, he was scared, so he didn't want to do what God asked him to. So he ran, a whale swallowed him. Three days he repented and came out and then um, did exactly what God asked him to in the end of the book. Anyone else hear that? What if I told you that that's not how the story went? Do you ever feel like um, you spend more effort doing something the wrong way than it would take to do something the right way? This is one of those stories. I'm going to pray. Lord, um, I ask that you remove all anxiousness, anxiety. Lord, that uh, my voice is removed and yours is replaced. We just thank you that we're able to go through this book. We just thank you for who you are. And be with us today. Amen. We're going to start in Jonah 1. But I want to, I want to get back to that subject of um, doing something completely wrong that takes more effort than doing something right. When I was a kid, my job, there were six of us and there were six rooms in the house. So, each kid took turns doing one room on a Monday, and then Tuesday you'd move to the next room. When it was my turn to vacuum, my mom was always at work, my dad was at work. When it was my turn to vacuum, I had a little rake, a little toy rake, and I would put a, <laughs> mom, this is the first time you're hearing this, I would put a towel over the rake, and I would rake lines in the carpet, because my mom was always looking at the lines of the carpet to make sure that we vacuumed or not. I spent so long making sure each line was perfect. And then when I would get to the dishes, I would pretend like there were some, the, the dishes in the dishwasher were dirty. So I would restart the dishwasher. So when my mom got home, I was like, hey mom, I, I loaded it. And she was like, those dishes were already clean. And then you moved to the laundry. And my wife is laughing because yeah, this is still today, isn't it? Yeah, this is still going on today. Um, we get to the laundry and the clothes in the dryer were done, but I would grab a couple out and wet them in the sink and then throw them back in. I spent so much time and effort doing my wife, I can't look at it right now because this is my life now. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I spent so much time and effort doing the wrong thing when it would have taken so much little effort, less effort, to do the right thing. And this is where we're at. We're going to start in Jonah 1.1. 1, 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come before me. Let, me. let me give you a backstory here. Jonah is a prophet. Jonah is uh, called, rightly so, the reluctant prophet. He's also the prodigal prophet. If you look at the first two chapters, he is the younger son in the prodigal son. In chapters 3 and 4, he is the older son in the prodigal son. So he's called by God. A prophet is one who God speaks to and he's supposed to speak to the people. 
He is called to go to Nineveh. Now, as a child, I was told that he was scared to go, so he didn't want to go. Nineveh was a wicked, wicked city. I'm just giving you back. Let's lay some foundation for this sermon series. Nineveh was a wicked city. So wicked that they would go into cities, wipe out the entire population, and then in front of their gates, they would stack the heads of the men in a pyramid that they killed. They would also, and I'm sorry if there's kids in here, they would also get um, the men that they were fighting against. They would cut off both legs and then the left arm so that they could shake the hand of the man mockingly as he died. They would also have the women and children hold up the heads of the husbands and fathers that they had murdered and parade, put on a little parade through town. This was the city that Jonah was called to. So Jonah was, uh, during the reign of, of uh, King Jeroboam II, Jonah was one of the advisors, and he was strong into the military presence that this king had where he was saying, this is our land, we're going to protect it at all costs. And God comes to him and says, you're going to now go to the city that you despise and you hate. How many of you, honestly, as a kid, or now, thought that the reason why Jonah ran was because he was scared to go to this city? I was told that for years and years, that he was scared to go to the city. This is not true. I'm going to give you a sneak, pre sneak peek in uh, chapter 3, it says, um, hold on a minute. In chapter 4, God has great mercy on the city of Nineveh. And here's what Jonah says. This is why I was so quick to flee. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So he's saying, the reason why I am going to run, I'm not scared of the city, is I don't want God to bless my enemies. Have you ever been there where you feel like you've done exactly what God has asked you to, and then he starts to bless your enemies instead of you. This is where Jonah's at. So he does the exact op opposite of what God says, if you continue in Jonah. It says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed to Tarshish, to flee from the Lord. So he did the exact opposite of what God had called him to. God called him to go east. Do you know what, what Nineveh is today? Nineveh is Iraq. Not, my, not many things have changed. So he asked him, go this way, 500 miles to the east, and he asked him to go inland. That's the, that's the path that he was going to take. Everything that, every decision that he has made, he does the exact opposite. He's called to go east, he goes west. He's called to go inland. He, he gets on a boat and he goes west. He goes 2,500 miles in the opposite direction when God is calling him to go 500 miles one way. All because he doesn't want God to bless his enemies. Have you been here where you say, Jonah is saying here, because he couldn't see any good reasons for God's command, there couldn't be any. Because he couldn't see what, why God was asking him to do something, there obviously couldn't be a good reason, so I'm not going to do it. If there is a God and we think, he doesn't know what he's doing. Why would he ask me to do this? Does God know best or do we? A lot of the times, our default is saying, if I don't see a reason or a purpose for what God has called me to do, I, I think I know better than God. And that gets us to point number one. 
I, I want to warn you guys that this entire series, and it's been this way for me, is like a punch to the gut every single week. Because I feel like it's going to mold us and shape us in the p- people that God wants us to, despite what we would like. Point number one, and you should have your uh, n- notes in your bulletin. God, always, God doesn't always tell you things that you like. God doesn't always tell you to do things that you like. Jonah did not like this. Jonah was, and, and this was the very first time in the, in the Bible to this point that God has called a prophet to leave his town to go to a city of non-believers. So you have Amos who, who would talk to the unbelievers, but that was in his hometown. This is, this is the first time that God is saying, I want you to leave this comfort, this safety of these believers, and I want you to go to this non-believing city. What happens when God calls you to do something that, that seems to bless your enemies instead of you? What happens when you do exactly what God has called you to do? But we, we don't want to do it. We have this default within us that says, God, I don't understand I'm not going to like this outcome, and I know I'm not going to like this outcome. I don't want to do this. I have a question. Do you really think that David wanted, wanted to fight Goliath? 13-year-old boy. Do you think he wanted to? Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you think they wanted, wanted to get into that fiery furnace? Or look at Daniel. Do you think that Daniel wanted to get into that den of lions? Look at Jesus. Do you think that Jesus wanted, wanted to go to the cross? But my flesh is weak, but my spirit is willing. You, church, will not always be called to do things that you want to do. God is calling you to do things that he needs done. Can you imagine doing that with, uh, we have some coaches here. Can you imagine on the football field when your number is called and the the play is there and you know that this play, I'm essentially sacrificing my body and I'm going to get hit and I'm going to get tackled and you go before the coach and say, hey coach, I'm going to sit this one out. Uh, what, are you, what are you talking about? Well, I know that, that uh, in this play is the play that I get tackled. I don't really want to do that, so I'm just going to sit this one out. Yet we do that as Christians. When maybe, just maybe, you being tackled will result in a touchdown for your team. But are we willing to say, God, I, I don't really want to do this, but if you're calling me, I will do this. And it goes on to say, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. Underline that. Each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he had lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and we will not perish. These sailors were caught up in the storms of life. How many of us have blamed God for the storms that have hit? Maybe after our obedience, or maybe just by happenstance. Most often the storms of life come come upon us because of the consequences of sin entering this world. A lot of the times you did nothing to cause the storm that's around you. A lot of times you did. But there's a lot of storms in your life that aren't the cause of your unfaithfulness or lack of obedience. But because of us turning from the truth, 
back when Adam and Eve were here and sin entering the world. God is not like a chess player just casually moving us around like pawns, although it feels that way at times, doesn't it? Like, God, I don't, I don't see the reason. But here's the, here's the tough pill and the punch in the gut is usually it's not till years later or maybe even never that we understand why God moved us in the position that he did. And you have these sailors who didn't ask for the storm. And you notice something. They're all calling on their God. What's, who's Jonah calling on? This is a prophet of God and he's not calling on him. He's not talking to him. He doesn't even mention him. You have sailors who are, who are non-believers, who have their own pagan gods, acting more like Christians than Jonah is. And he's in this sleep, this deep sleep. Have you ever been in such a, where, in such a sorrowful place, depressed state, that you just want to lay down and fall asleep? This is where I believe Jonah was. Where he wants to lay down and he just wants to sleep it off, the sleep of sorrow. And he didn't want to go to Nineveh to talk to the pagans about God or lead them toward faith. So he fled, and look at how God worked in the midst of his disobedience. He was talking to these same types of pagans about God. And that leads us to point number two. Your calling is not for your glory, but for God's glory. I have to check myself a lot where I have to realize, Matt, this isn't about your glory. Whether the praise or the, uh, the negative words, I have to remind myself, this is not for your glory, Matt. This is for God's glory. These sailors are more ready to call on Jonah's God than, God, than Jonah himself. At every point, they outshine Jonah. Where it says, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. This, they outshine Jonah at every point. This is far too common. Another punch to the gut. Far too common in the church today. Is that we have non-believers outshining Christians. Where we have the common grace, and I love, I love how the book of Jonah talks about the common grace and special grace. Common grace are the gifts that God bestows on all of us, whether we're believers or not. The talents that we have, the gifts, the abilities. Special grace is when we come to know Jesus and it moves us into eternity. They have common grace and they're showing it. They're talking, they're talking about Jonah's God more than Jonah is. They're outshining them. They're more gracious, more kind, more forgiving. Does this remind you of non, any non-believers in your life? Why are we, we have this gift of Jesus Christ, this gift of the Holy Spirit, and we're letting people who don't know Jesus outshine us, who don't have the Holy Spirit, who are more kind and more gracious and more loving than we could ever hope to be. Shouldn't the opposite be true? Shouldn't we be the ones in the boat saying, we got to call on God right now? And we have this memorable picture of this, this heathen captain reprimanding God's holy prophet. He's reprimanding God's holy prophet. And he deserved it. And to the most part, the church in America deserves it too. Is we have to start acting like Jesus is the captain of our ship. We have to start acting that we have something different. Not that we're better, but we're set apart because of the gift of what, or what we've, we've asked God to come into our life. This whole grace thing. We have to start acting like we've been blessed with something so amazing. And Jonah... He wants to hang out with his own city, right? His own believers. I told you today and in, in, in the next few weeks will be a punch. 
With church, don't we tend to just want to hang out with other church members? I'm talking to myself as well. Don't we just want to hang out in our little church community, talk with those who have the same beliefs, sometimes exclusively? Jonah wanted to exclusively serve believers like him. But God shows that he's the God of all people. He reaches these sailors, and Jonah needs to see himself, and we need to see ourselves as part of the human community rather than the church community. Some of my favorite people to hang out with are those who know nothing about church, who know nothing about Jesus, because I love seeing this transformation, this process of God, I get to start from the very beginning of this, this growing seed in their life until maybe they're an elder in the church. I get to be a part of that. And if I, if I kept it to church community, my circle would be so small. I don't want you to start drawing circles around yourselves and saying, I'm only going to hang out with... I, I had a, a pastor that I knew who said the only people that he will counsel or hang out with are believers. Let that sink in. He said he doesn't want to lower his morality level by hanging with non-believers. So I said, let's make a deal. I'll take the non-believers, you take everyone else. You take the perfect Christians. Because we're called to be, we're called to go to Nineveh. We're called to hang out on the boat with these sailors instead of withdrawing and saying, I don't want to be a part of these people. This may hit home. Jonah's private faith does no public good. I'm going to retreat, get on a different ship, and then when I realize the pagans are on this ship, I'm going to go down into the, into the bows of the ship and I'm going to fall asleep. Your private faith will do no public good. I hope that when people talk about who Matt Wyatt was, Jesus is the first thing that they mention. I want to be known by others that I'm a Christ lover. Common grace. They asked who he was. Right here it says, So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? What, from what people are you? I did some study on this back in this time. When they would ask someone this, they would ask, essentially, who is your God? That's what they're getting at right here. Who is your God? Why? Because there were so many beliefs back then, so many pagan gods. They wanted to know, which one do you follow? And look at how Jonah responds. I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and land. Because of him, so a lot of Bible scholars will write this. I did a lot of study on this. Because of him talking about his ethnicity first, that's the first thing he claims, is his ethnicity. And then he talks about God. <laughs> that was a great one for such a little body. They're, they're essentially saying not who are you, but whose are you? And he, and he mentions the Hebrew first, and then he talks about God. When people ask you, whose are you? Is it your identity in your work? Or your relationships? Or is it the Lord Almighty Jesus Christ? I'm a Christian first, and then I'm a father. I'm a Christian first, and then I'm a husband. I'm a Christian first, and then I'm a pastor. I'm a Christian first, and then I'm everything else. If you want Jesus first, then any identity based on your own achievement and performance is an insecure one. And it won't hold up. We're, gonna, we're beginning to see that Jonah is in desperate need. Get this, ir irony. Jonah is in desperate need of the very mercy that he refused to give to other people. Because they threw lots and it landed on him. Lots meaning they would write people's names on sticks, throw it down. Jonah's name. 
And that's when they asked, Who's are you? Why is this happening? And he says, This terrified them, and they said, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up, throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Look at the graciousness still of these non-believers. Instead, the men did, need, did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Leads us to point number three. Our Christian motto has to be, we need to decrease so God and others can increase. He's saying, throw me into the sea and it will be calm. This is my fault. This is me. Some may think of this as repentance. But look at the text. There's no words of repentance. I believe that he's somewhere in between submitting to God and still rebelling just a little bit. They've been calling on their gods while Jonah hasn't spoken of his. The first step, if you, if you find yourself lost or broken or in, in this place where you're like, Lord, I don't know where I am, do you know the first step to come into your senses spiritually? Is serving somebody else. Is helping somebody else. Ten-step process to getting away from yourself. Number one, serve somebody else. Number two, repeat that step nine more times. And you will get out of your own head. You will get out of this selfish behavior that you're in. This is, this is what Jesus is. This substitutionary sacrifice. In Matthew 14, it talks about Jesus is greater than Jonah because Jonah gave his life he said, I'm going to give my life for these sailors. Jesus gave his life for everybody. So he's saying, I'm greater than Jonah. I'm going to not only die for these people, but for all people. And this is what I'll close with. Then they cried to the Lord in verse 14. Oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. I'm excited for next week when we talk about prayers from inside of the fish. But I want to... I want to talk about why God does things that, that maybe don't seem right to you. Or he seems cruel. These sailors in the original text cried out Yahweh. Which moved from little g God to a relationship, Lord, Savior. These, a lot of Bible scholars will say that these people cried out to the Lord, the, the correct Lord. And they were saved. This isn't a cry to God in some fleeting moment, I'm in trouble. This was after the storm stopped. After the entire storm stopped and they're safe. And now they're crying out to, to Jesus. They're crying out to Yahweh. What if I told you that because of your obedience, your enemies could be saved and know Jesus? Are you okay with that? Are you okay with being in eternity with your enemy? Are you okay with following God's plan, even though I don't want to do this, Lord, but it's going to get a lot of people saved? 2019 for my wife and I are going to be, we're we'll stopped running from God. And when God calls, we have to do it, no matter how hard it is, no matter how much of a struggle it is. Why? Because there's lives on the other side of that obedience. Two things that God wants, faith and obedience. 
Obedience is our job. Outcome is God's job. If you don't like the outcome, just wait until you're in, in eternity with him, and then he will show you, this is why I had to do what I had to do. Jonah runs because he doesn't want any part of the mercy that God's given his enemies. How many of us in here today are running from God's calling because we're afraid that he's going to either bless our enemies or maybe not make our life any more comfortable? I don't want to be comfortable. I want to be followers of Jesus. I want this church to be so caught up in the following of Jesus that everyone else around us is becoming saved. Why? Because those believers who are in this room, they already have their spot in the book of life. You already have that spot. But there's so much room for other names. Are you okay with God blessing your enemies? I know for years I was not okay. And I ran. But these enemies have now become friends. And I have to get used to getting along with them because there's a long time in eternity that I'm going to be spending with some of these people. But guess what? Jesus is right there with us. And he's calling us to do something. The one thing that Jonah ran from of showing mercy and grace to these pagan believers, because of it, even in spite of his disobedience, pagans got the mercy and grace. So stay tuned to next week when what happens inside the belly of a fish. Can you imagine, after three days, the stench of Jonah? Some people say, I believe this is a parable or a fable. I don't believe that. I believe that this happened. I love um, how one professor wrote, if the Bible told me that Jonah swallowed a big fish, I would believe it. But God is calling us to do something that's going to hurt. Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe it's mercy. Maybe it's grace. And it's going to hurt. But I promise you, when we get to the other side of eternity, there's going to be a reason and a roadmap of saying, look at all the lives that were saved because of your obedience. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that we're able to learn about this. We thank you that, Lord, you have the beginning and the end, all laid out. Lord, you're calling some of us in this room, you've been calling us for months to do something. And maybe we're not running in the opposite direction, but we're still staying still. And delayed obedience is still disobedience. I pray that you touch our heart and our soul, give us the strength and the courage to move toward Nineveh to get back on the track that you've asked us to. Lord, and I pray for those who don't understand why you did certain things or why you are doing things. Lord, that you give us peace in our heart and allow us to release that to you because you know everything, Lord, beginning and end. If there's anyone in this room that has not yet accepted the free gift, but the Bible says you have to believe in your, with your heart and speak with your lips that you are king, that you came to this earth, lived a sinless life, yet died a sinner's death. Our death. But it didn't stop there. Three days later, you rose again. There's one empty tomb, Lord, and that was you. If there's anyone in this room that has called on Jesus for the first time, with every eye closed, I'd like to pray for you this week in my office. Would you just raise your hand if you'd like that? Lord, we thank you for who you are, despite what we've done. But I pray that we can continue following you, Lord, no matter how hard it is. In your name we pray. Amen.